Okay, good afternoon. I mean, the first part of the presentation is basically what I showed you guys last year, but for the new fellows and people who don't do CT routinely, it's a refresher. So compared to the, uh, obviously our new fellows are so used to our new scanner, this is, sounds like it's nothing new, but you gotta know that most of the places in the country uh, don't have the scanner we have. So if you ever go out there and practice, uh, likely you would not have uh, access to the advanced scanner that tertiary center like us would have. Um, most of them, most of you guys are going to have probably access to 64 slices CT scanner. That's what we have in two or three out of our sister hospital. The other two or three sister hospital, the newer one, is going to have a better scanner. But nevertheless, even in Houston metropolitan area, uh, the most advanced scanner is not available. Uh, so the most important changes for the last five years in terms of the CT scanner is the coverage. Anatomical coverage has become much bigger, okay? So 64 slices scanner. We kind of shy away from saying, okay, how many slices your CT scanner? That's really not that important anymore. What really imp care, we care is how much uh, anatomical coverage each time the scanner go around the, the body can cover and you know, with the 64 slices traditional scanner you cover about four centimeter. So the newer scanner you can cover 16 centimeter which is roughly how much uh, most of the heart size would be. So essentially the whole idea is to have a, a cardiac CT in one single rotation of your gantry and obtain what we call single heartbeat imaging. So you acquire the, heart, the coronary angiogram or entire cardiac structure in single heartbeat, and which is very unique, obviously, uh, for all the non-invasive imaging. There's no other non-invasive imaging or even invasive imaging allows you to, to take a picture of the heart in one single heartbeat. So that's, uh, if you sit down and think about it, it's mind boggling, you know. As a matter of fact, the real actual imaging time is less than duration of one single heartbeat is around 240 milliseconds. So you, 200, all the preparation goes in, basically take the pictures when, the, when Miguel or Jeanette you know, push the button, in 240, 270, 240 milliseconds, you get the entire data set. Then you spend hours and hours looking into it, and maybe at days and days in generating report. So uh, anyway. So this is how it works, a uh, single uh, heartbeat, and because you're imaging the heart only during a, such a short period of time, you're giving the patient very low dose radiation. That's, that's just, uh, um, I would say, the benefit, a very important benefit, right? Uh, so essentially, you can acquire single, in single heartbeat, the entire cardiac structure with one to two millisiever of radiation. Bear in mind the uh, average background radiation for people for us who live here in Houston is about uh, two to three millisiever. If you live in Denver, it's probably going even higher. So essentially, you can have a CT angiogram, cardiac coronary CT angiogram, with about three to four months of background radiation. So this is just an example of a difference between how we generate images using older generation scanner, four centimeter coverage, that's the most common one, versus one single a rotation, white anatomical coverage. You can see uh, clearly the difference. One is the whole picture, the other one you actually stitch them together. Therefore, invariably, because the heart moves and there's some changes in the heartbeat, you're not gonna you never generate a perfect picture like the one on the right hand side with the wide coverage uh, CT scanner. Again, you guys seen this picture before. Um, so what's all most important thing is since you have uniform um, images and all the images, all the entire area that you're scanning are acquired exactly at the same time, which is very important. So it allows you to uh, to do uh, uniform perfusion quantification, which with uh, a 64 C slice CT scanner, because the top portion of the heart might have different contrast compared to the bottom portion of the heart. 
So you can kind of compare uh, uh, the degree of attenuation in different times. So single heart imaging is very, very, very uh, advantageous for myocardial perfusion for that reason. Um, again, this is just some of the example. Um, the spatial resolution can be down to 0 0.5 millimeter. Uh, with the newer crystal detector material, some vendor even claim they can go down to 0 0.5 millimeter. So getting kind of close to the special resolution of the invasive angiogram, but we're not quite there yet. That's not, 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 not exactly uh, routine. But again, that's the reason why we don't like to talk about how many slices, okay? You're gonna have uh, see brochure like this, Toshiba, now I think they have six, 640 slice CT scanners. So it's really not exactly 640 slice of the road of detectors. It's still 320 slices, and they threw some changes, uh, manipulation, uh, electronic manipulation, they can generate from each road of detector two slices. So essentially the anatomical coverage is still the same as for instance, G256 slices uh, detector CT. Uh, basically the coverage is only, um, uh, they are the same, okay? So both Toshiba 640 slice CT covers the same area as G256. So you can, you can see why we don't like to talk about slices anymore in our, uh, Dual source CT scanner, do you know? Anybody have any idea how many slices? Let's see, how many detectors? Okay, where's our CT fellow right now? John, I know you. So we have two detectors, each, two, two source, okay? We have two detectors. How many, each of them, how many rows of crystals we have? Okay, I'll make it easier for you, it's 96. Okay, but if you look at Siemens, they're gonna tell you this 192 slices. Okay, so technically they say we have two 192 slices, so technically, how are you gonna say that? 384 slices? It just doesn't make any sense. The whole point is our uh, Siemens scanner with 96 uh, road detector covers six centimeter. That's what we care, right? You, you wanna know how much with each single rotation, uh, how much anatomical coverage you have, so our dual source CT is six centimeter, and the G top of the line, and Toshiba covers 16, okay, centimeter, so it's a big difference. Okay, so this is a rationale behind what we call Z-axis coverage. Essentially, um, you multiply by the width of the detector, by the row of the detector, that give you that anatomical coverage. And with this technology that almost every vendor has called Z-Flying Focal Spot Technique, basically with the same source, you can uh, sample twice, so you increase your number of slices. Okay. So uh, I'm not gonna go through it. We went through that already. And uh, again, I'm gonna go through real quick. Uh, with, with the temporal resolution is still the Achilles tendon of CT compared to other non-invasive image angiogram. And the reason being, you know, we're talking about several tons of material. You're going to make a spin uh, uh, at, you know, several, uh, several G-force. Uh, so that's, you know, this is our scanner when it was installed. So you can see, uh, as I mentioned last time, there's a reason why they cover the scanner, right? Because if you see this, I don't think anybody would want to go in there. Um, it's, it's, it's impressive. They generate over 35 G of rotation speed. Uh, okay. So with dual detector, we kind of solve a little bit of the problem. So instead of uh, rotating 180 degree to acquire the images with two source, we only have to uh, rotate 90 degrees. So basically, we, we have the temporal, uh, the time to acquire the images, so we, uh, double, the, uh, it will improve by, uh, by two, the temporal resolution. Uh, the, G, the Siemens scanner rotate 250 uh, milliseconds, so technically we have temporal resolution of 62 milliseconds. Uh, GE has the newest technology, it's called Whisper. Uh, 
and uh, allow them to rotate. The entry rotation is 200, 200 milliseconds. So technically, if you could have a gantry rotation of 200 milliseconds, you have dual source, you can reach that kind of ideal uh, cardiovascular imaging temporal resolution of 50 milliseconds. Okay, so 20, 20 frame per second, I think that's very reasonable for, calcul for accurate calculation of uh, uh, the volume and, uh, and function. So not there yet, but getting close. Okay, the other major feature of the dual source CT, because we have two sources, you can move this, uh, again, uh, um, uh, you can move the scanner, the table faster without losing data, okay? So that allows you to scan the patient real fast. Again, the advantage is if you scan the patient uh, in fast uh, mode, you're exposing the patient with less radiation, okay? And allows also to, for you to image, it, especially pediatric population. Uh, so essentially, you can uh, image um, maybe not coronary uh, structure uh, without breath hole. And the scan time Tavar, if you really you know, it can go down to less than two 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 seconds. And because again, uh, you're scanning a short, such a short period of time, you don't need that much contrast. All this potential benefit of uh, could be achieved with our new sc scanner of either dual source or white coverage uh, approach, okay? So again, um, yeah, you can reduce the iodine low, dual energy. Uh, we went through this glass here. Uh, so essentially, uh, just give you some idea, now the temporal resolution, the best temporal resolution is the scanner we have upstairs, 65 milliseconds. But the best anatomical coverage is GE and Toshiba, a 16 centimeter scanner who allows you to acquire images in one single heartbeat. Uh, so as a dual source CT, obviously. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because this is, I think I, I, I showed this the la in the last, last, um, last lecture I have a pitfall. Okay, I wanna kinda show you guys something and generally maybe uh, some discussion since we have uh, Dr. Shah and Dr. Q here, which I know he's very passionate about this kind of topic. So this is kind of what we, achieve, we can achieve with current technology CT, okay? You can assess luminous stenosis, you can do plaque imaging, you can do functional analysis, EF, volume, we can do myocardial perfusion, we can do CT, FFR. Okay, what's the problem? The problem is the scanner costs only $2 million, right? And, uh, and everyone has been to our CT scanner knows you require a huge area. So, you know, so it's not ready for the prime time in terms of day-to-day -day management of a patient who show up in our clinic with suspected chest pain, okay? So I'm gonna show you some, some development, not exactly a technology, technological advancement which I think could potentially change how we manage the patient, uh, our patient especially with uh, chest pain, with possible cardiac etiology. Obviously for that, to, for, for what I think could happen require a little bit more than just technology. It requires some policy changes and, uh, from the payers and for the government obviously. So number one development, I think you probably heard this already from Dr. Pam Douglas talk and other sources that you know, in British guideline, which is called NICE, uh, has changed their guideline in terms of how, they, how, how, we sh how we should approach patients with suspected coronary disease. This is what their guideline prior to 2017. If you read about it, it's very similar to what we told you guys, right? Would you agree? Anybody have any suggestion difference, right? We go by pretest likelihood. If it's low, you don't do anything, right? Although most of the most of the people still do some testing, even the pretest likelihood is low. Or very high pretest likelihood, technically, you can cath a patient, it's okay. But, um, but in, the, in the middle, right, 10 to, between 10% to 90%, which is the vast majority of the patient, we, in this country, we do some type of a, a stress test with imaging, right? Despite the recommendation from the, most of our society guideline is still plain treadmill. If they can exercise and, and you don't have LVH and left bundle, correct? 
you know, in England, there's a little, a little bit advanced. They recommend calcium score. Uh, if you, you know, the pretest likelihood is not as high, kind of in sync of what, at least what we've been doing because, uh, you know, in this center, we did a lot, we did a lot of work with calcium score and we, and we know that, that, that uh, added the benefit of knowing the calcium burden in addition to stress test, okay? Because you know the, uh, the normalcy rate, the, you know, the number, percentage of tests that we do in outpatient who are normal, both stress echo and stress nuclear is, you know, it's about 80 to 90 percent of the, uh, the time are all negative, right? So, uh, so this England. So, uh, and uh, and in the most recent guideline, they took away the pretest likelihood. They think it's just not very useful, and they recommend coronary CTA as first line mitigation in all patients with atypical and typical angina. Okay even for those who are asymptomatic but have ECG changes. So really encompass most of the people that we see in the clinic. And the rationale is not so much of scientific, uh, although there's some data, there's a lot of data actually, I should say, the support they use, but this anatomical approach is based mostly on the service provision. Those patients with stable disease should be tailored toward the needs of the population to optimize cost effectiveness. So um, because they know the uh, healthcare resources now is, is limited, so you can you have to show the strategy that offer the best outcome, with the uh, least amount of uh, resources. So, and, and as I mentioned, most of the pa 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 patient that we test are, is going to be negative, so it's important to have a test that tailor mostly to low to intermediate uh, pretest likelihood. Uh, we cover most of the patients, so we need a test with high, very very high negative. Uh, predictive value in assessment of a patient with disease or not. Because not only you want to know basically if the patient had uh, functional stenosis, but you want to know if they have underlying uh, atherosclerosis because that should, would change how you approach the patient. So this is a guideline based on essentially two large study over 10,000, or actually 14,000 patients showing the negative predictive value of CT angiogram in excluding presence of disease and also in predicting an excellent outcome. So, uh, and I think, you know, for our uh, non-invasive testing uh, strategy, it took several decades for stress echo and nuclear to accumulate uh, amount of data evidence to, to generate our current guideline. With CT, it really took uh, probably less than half of those time, which is pretty impressive. So that's one development. So I think the tendency, thing, I think most of people agree, even if you ask Dr. Mamarian on the side, he likes CT even, you know, he likes nuclear, but I think in the heart, he likes CT better, if you ask him. Do you agree for the fellow? Huh? Who does clinic with him? Okay. So you think you order more CT or nuclear stress test? CT. CT? Well, that says something. <laughs> okay, and obviously the, the one major criticism with CT is obviously the artifact and the, a very low positive predictive value, meaning if you see a stenosis, it may not be functionally significant. And we went through this, we presented the new development of the CTFFR, which is a technology, if you think about it, it's quite pretty impressive because it doesn't require any special stress test, no adenosine, no exercise, no diperidamol. Basically, it's a single CT scan like what we do routinely, nothing fancy, exactly the same way we acquire a resting CT scan. And through com uh, computational flow modeling, they can um, uh, give you a virtual FFR, okay? And there's a lot of data. That's probably one of the most uh, published uh, topic in CT literature for the last several years. And when Dr. Douglas was here, she also presented some data. So bottom line is, is the scientific evidence that it works, not perfect, but it's probably as good or, or even better than some of the non-invasive imaging technology that we have in predicting, uh, comparing to invasive FFR. So it works pretty well. Uh, and important is FDA approved technology and just starting this year, you receive a category three CPT code. I'm no expert, but I think Dr. Shah could explain you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, 
That means uh, American Medical Association give the green light for, for the physician to be able to put in a code so t potentially you can uh, not argue, but you can uh, discuss with the insurance company and they would probably pay for it. So it's not a done deal. So, so every new technology has to go through this phase. The FDA need to approve it. They need to get a CPT code, and eventually, I think uh, Institute of Medicine, Medicare will, you know, give you a rate. And you, so, it's going to become mainstream, I think, eventually, because there's really enough data, and and especially in uh, saving uh, in terms of health healthcare costs, because it prevent, not prevent, it, it decreases the number of invasive angiogram and even non-invasive testing that you need to do. So eventually. Uh, with the CT scan you acquire, uh, now the turnaround time is about, so, so how, 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 let's put this, how does that work? So you, you, you get your CT images, you send it via, uh, 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 via internet to, to a secure website, and the company will run analysis for you. It takes, I think right now, the turnaround time, probably around, uh, I think, four to five hours, I think. So technically, in four to five hours, you would you would know if a stenosis you see in the CT angiogram is functionally significant or not, okay? But I think really the next thing I'm going to show you would be, uh, I think, not a, could be a potential game changer, especially here from the United States because most of the tests is being done in the office. Uh, so there's a, now in the market a dedicated cardiac CT scanner, okay? It's a very compact scanner, can fit into a doctor's office, uh, use a smaller room, uh, it's, it's about, they need a room that's about 15 by 15 meter compared to twice as much of our scanner half, for instance, upstairs, which you need about 27 to 30 meter uh, uh, wide. And it's important it's for such a compact scanner, the anatomical coverage is 140 millimeter or, or 14 centimeters. So one single rotation. So this small scan, compact scanner allows you to do single heartbeat uh, acquisition of the corn, uh, cardiac structure with a very, very good gantry rotation time of 240 milliseconds, so the temporal resolution is 120. So for most of the coronary uh, applications, uh, if the patient heart rate is in the 60, you can have very good uh, image quality. And with some software, you can even improve even further. Uh, and, and for that small scanner, you can also do even tower planning uh, so it's a 14, so 280 row of detectors, 14 centimeter coverage, uh, average scan acquisition time, 120 milliseconds, okay? Radiation, radiation dosage, most of them I put it there, it's about two, three millisievert, and the field of view focus, very important. Focus only at the heart, okay? 16 by 25, with our current, with our scanner, big scanner that I mentioned, you know, that I showed you earlier, the coverage is about twice. So basically, the whole chest is in your field of view. But this, only the heart and a little bit around it. Uh, so you so need a small room. And because uh, this, this scanner is, it was developed by a company based in Israel who de developed this scanner based on two unique technology. Obviously, it's, uh, it's a trade secret, but essentially, they have a si uh, design similar to, to, to dual source. It's called Stereo CT. Uh, so they have two source also, so basically um, uh, allows you to have pretty good temporal resolution and good coverage, and they have focused field of view, again, only, only to, the, to the heart. Uh, so basically they have, so they have low cost, to, so the cost is pretty, pretty cheap, so according to them. And they can generate pretty decent images, actually, uh, I shouldn't say decent, compared to regular 64 size CD scanner, the image quality is as good. So, uh, and most impressively, it, it can incorporate a lot of, I would say 90% of the things that you can do in the big scanner, it can be done in this compact scanner, including motion correction, metal artifact, calcium, you can do calcium score, you can assess the plaque, you can do perfusion, you can do TAVAR planning, uh, you can do 3D printing. What they cannot do is KV switching, but again, that's not clinically uh, routinely done anyway. And important thing for all the fellows, right? When we read there, sometimes we spend more time looking outside the heart. When you have a normal coronary CTA, you spend 
probably what, 30 seconds to look through the images, you know it's normal, but then you need to spend another 10 minutes to look outside the heart. So imagine, it's like echo nuclear cardiology, right? We don't spend our time looking outside the heart, why not do the same thing with cardiac CT? So basically, uh, for the current guideline, SCCT recommend is mandatory that you report any structure outside the heart. So one potential, and obviously we don't get paid for reading those things either, right? So why not just, you know, have field of view focus on the heart and just read the heart, which what the test is indicated, okay? And this, and the other thing is, I think this is the main problem. I just called this morning to our Smith 19 lab. They told me next time, next available stress test for nuclear, March 9th. Today is what? February 26th. So 10 days, okay, for stress echo. I couldn't believe that. Two weeks, wait. For treadmill, almost a month. Uh, obviously, you know, I think most of the better run prior practice doesn't have this number. As a matter of fact, if you want to get it done in the hospital, you can get it done the same day but the cost is a lot higher. You know, you know that, uh, you know, if it's perform any stress test performed in the office, uh, the, re uh, the, the cost is less than if it's done in the hospital, okay? So, so I want you to put everything together, what I just told you, okay? So you can imagine a scenario that I think evidence showed that the first line of um, not, uh, management of a patient with a suspected coronary disease in your clinic with chest pain. Okay, if you think about it right now, John, you see a patient in the clinic with who you do you do you, you do your clinic with? Uh bowel clinic, so we don't deal with chest pain. Okay. <laughs> oh you may, okay, let's put okay, when was the last time when you're doing regular <coughs> clinic? Um, last year? In, yeah. Okay. June. Okay, what would you do usually when someone comes in with chest pain, you know, fifty years old, some typical atypical features? EKG, okay, so you end up most likely do, getting a stress test, correct? Yeah. So think about the process. You order a stress test, my text, with luck, you get it done the same week, all right? And I'll ask Dr. Shah, when you get your result of the stress test, when's the patient, when, act, when, when does the patient know exactly what they have and what they need to do? That's pretty good. I would say most of the time we remember and our system works well with, with EPIC, I think works a little bit better. I don't think the patient would have to get a result of what they need to be, you know, if it's someone who is not very critical, or high risk, they might get it, the result, discussion with the physician two weeks later, 10 days, roughly. Yeah, okay. No, no, you know, but you know, by the time you get the test and you talk to them, you know, so it's not, not, not unusual, maybe seven days or one week later. But imagine the scenario you can have, let's say that you're allowed to do CT uh, in your clinic, right? I mean, someone will show up in your clinic, okay, you can just basically in less than an hour or two, you have the, the result. So I want to hear what you guys think about having an office CT scanner would change your practice. Dr. Q. Uh, the microphone. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up together with the previous comment about the, the British guidelines putting CTA as the number one thing when you go to the ER with because they're kind of the same. I would be all, I think it would be terrific. Um, I think it would be terrific, provided two things. Because we have two problems in this country that perhaps our colleagues in UK don't have. Number one is that the, in, because you still are giving radiation. So number one thing would be that this information is available to every other doctor that this patient will see later. A, very important. Um, perhaps that's the most important thing of all. Um, and B, that the other doctors that see the patients, whether it's an emergency room in another place or another doctor somewhere else, have the courage to say, you already had this test, it was negative, your pain is atypical, you don't need anything else. Because otherwise, patients in this country sleep from one doctor to another, one hospital to another, and by the time, in five years, they'll have three or four of these CTAs, all showing normal coronaries. Correct. And then we're going to be having concerns about excessive radiation. So unless we can correct those two 
things that are happening in this country, I would be more cautious about this technology, even though from everything you said, it makes so much sense. So those two things would have to be fixed because I'm very concerned with patients still not being reassured enough, still having the pain coming back again, still getting worried. They go and see Dr. X, Dr. X gets another CTA. Or they go to another ER, they get another CTA. And in five years, they have three or four of them. Yeah, what happened to our currently with our patient coming with the chest pain to our, you know, to our emergency room? I mean, you can see some patients who have stress nuclear every, every year, every other year when they come. And, the, yeah. the other question I'd have, though, is, you know, this is a 64-slice CT scanner, so it's, it's a little bit of a stripped-down scanner. No, no, actually, single rotation, it covers 14 centimeter. So it's actually much better than a regular 64. Okay. Yeah. But I guess the question is still, what is the, the rate of false positives, right? I mean, the problem, that's the one challenge with CT is, are you going to be driving a lot of additional downstream testing? So, you know, if it's negative, that's great. But what if you see something borderline? Correct. Then now you drive other downstream testing. Yeah. So that's, you have to look at the other side of the coin yeah. also. So obviously this is not, uh, not, but one could envision in a short period of time, if you streamline, you have the patient done in a CT scanner and you generate the images, you know, when it's negative, we know it's straightforward. It's real easy to read. But... If you have any question, you could potentially just say, okay, instead of, you know, try to reconstruct all the trees, uh, try to figure out, okay, is it 50%, 70%, uh, you could just send it to uh, heart flow for CTFFR um, with the same patient. That patient doesn't need to stay for the resting imaging, for instance, right? They could have the CT scanner. You can, if they're negative, okay, and no disease, it's great. If there's no stenosis, they have, and they have calcium, they have plaques, okay, they need different treatment. Or if they have stenosis of undetermined degree, you send them to CTFFR, which in our practice is probably going to be around 40, most 30 to 40%. Uh, so, and those patients potentially could be done in, again, in four to five hours, you have the result in terms of uh, the stenosis functionally significant. Uh, and it obviously it has to happen that uh, it allows you, the reimbursement has to happen that allows you to, to order a CT. Um, but again, if they come to that, you get paid for a work of a you know, single payment, once limited amount of uh, dollars for certain diagnosis, or work out of certain uh, symptoms, right? You could imagine, currently we do echo, we do stress tests, it's really very, not very cost effective, right? I mean, ideally you do a quick CT, CTA, or you can just do a calcium score, you know, if the calcium score is zero, you could probably stop there, for instance, like the UK guideline. Only if the calcium score is over zero, you can go ahead and do the CTA, and again, uh, if they have indeterminate stenosis, certainly for CTFFR, and they have high-grade stenosis, and the patient have real symptom, depending on the location, that's another advantage of the CTA, right? I mean, if you have a 90 percent, you know there's a 90 percent mid-LAD, uh, or distal LAD, or mid-RCA, you can argue you don't even need to do invasive angiogram, technically. Right? You could just treat the patient medically, and then see how they respond uh, symptomatic standpoint. So anyway, any, any other thoughts, any fellows? You go on and practice. John, you're gonna be practicing. You're going back to Central Texas. West Texas, right? Maybe. Um. So your dad in practice. So what, what does he do? What, what's the, What's the setup of his practice in terms of, you know, what kind of tests they get? Yeah, I would think Nuke would probably be first line if they're going to do something beyond treadmill EKG. And that's, I think, Omar. Both your brother and, and dad is in practice in Houston, right? The amount of
amount of time required to interpret each uh, CT study, that's something that I find could be concerning just because of all the non-cardiac structures and the comfort of reading those non-cardiac structures as well. Yeah, well, with this new CT scanner, you don't have to because only you, can look, you only look at the heart. And let's say, you know, you, both you and, and John has become very proficient. I all know you, I know you guys you have your heart set intervention, right? Uh, how long would it take for you to read a normal CTA? Yeah, right? And imagine, I want you to go back and ask your dad to say, instead of your nuclear camera, you have a CT in your office and it takes you five minutes to read it. Because again, even if it's abnormal, right? As I mentioned, you don't really need to struggle. I mean, as Dr. James Bean say, if it's more than 10 minutes, it's not worth reading it. Okay, if, it's, you know, if you can assess in five minutes a lesion is more than 50 or 70%, I would just send it for CTFFR, right? So imagine that scenario, you, if you spend five, 10 minutes in each study, then you have a decision made, you need to go to cath lab, you're gonna stand, or it's medical therapy. I think that would do, a, at least if I'm the patient, I want to, you know, ideally, when I leave my doctor's office, even I have to wait, again, a couple of hours to get into my scanner, but I know the study is done in less than one second. You know, usually a stress echo takes about, what, half an hour, minimal. A nuclear depends, you need to do stress rest. It's almost four hours, four to six hour stress MRI. 45 minutes, scan time, right? Between the IV and stuff like that. So anyway, so I don't have the answer, but I would think, you know, for folks who want to go out in their practice, uh, you might have to think about it. Uh, so not only getting your nuclear license, right? You have the opportunity to get your CT certification, which by the way, you know the new rule about taking the new CT board, right? You guys heard about it? So those courses that we take for level, you know, when, you got, when you're already in practice, you go out there for one week, you spend one week reviewing cases, getting 50 cases live, you get a level two certification, okay? Then you allow to sit for the board. Starting next year, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Oops. Okay? So, I, and our fellows are lucky because you guys will be able to sit for the board because just the number of cases would do. Okay. So, Dr. Chang, can I ask something? Of course. This so is for discussion. FFR, I don't have. FFRCT, yeah. is it truly ready for clinical use across the country? I mean, it's a proprietary technology. Let's put it this way it's probably as good as nuclear to determine uh, functional significance of a lesion. We don't. We don't, we don't have the outcomes data to say that yet, though, do we? I mean, we don't have like a uh, defer trial like we have for regular FFR where you say, if we defer this lesion, we know it's safe for yeah. the patient. We don't have that data yet for CTFFR. Uh, there's small, small, uh, obvious small amount of data because it's a relatively new technology, but the way CT war is moving, I mean, as I mentioned to you, the, the study that I show you, oh, CT, when did we start doing CT here in this hospital? 2000. 2006, 2007, okay? So all this data that I show you, Promise, uh, you know, uh, Scott, I mean, this is within 10 years, we accumulated 100,000 patients of data. So trust me, hard, hard flow, I mean, the data was gonna be out in a couple of years, you have large amount of data. So I don't think, I personally don't think it would be different from other functional tests. And, and what makes attractive the use of CT is the demographics of our patients. Because if you were practicing in some other place, for example, Canada, okay? If you're practicing in Canada, primary care docs are filtering a lot of the chest pains that we see. So everywhere we, every data you see in the US, at least 80%, but often more than 80, of people with chest pain do not have angina. So because of the way we practice here, the CTA becomes very attractive because even if you have a little bit of false positivity, Deepan, then you go next to a nuclear stress or you go to something else. I mean, you're not going to go from a CTA to a cabbage, right? You're going to go from a positive CTA 
probably to something else unless the patient has just fantastic textbook symptoms and the lesion is 90%. So most of the time you will then put some functionality which hopefully the FFR will be then the next step that you could do. I mean, put, tying it all together. If you were practicing in a place where, where the primary care docs are filtering, by the time the patient comes to you with chest pain, guess what? Now it's not 80% normal. It's the opposite. Right. It's 80% has significant disease. That then may change how you think about it. So a lot of this is, is not, not so much science, but it's the application of the technology to a reality in this country, which is 80% of people coming to docs with chest pain don't have real disease. And they come into the cardiologist. They should be filtered by a PCP, but the PCP is not filtering it. He's saying, oh, you have to go and see the cardiologist. So that is reality we live, and I think this technology then in that situation could be, like you said, very cost effective and, and very efficient. I think the other benefit too is if they're totally, totally normal and they don't even have any plaque, you can much more confidently say, than say you have a nuke that's negative. You don't know if they have <laughs> coronary disease or not. Correct, correct. No, yeah. That's, that's, that's very important as John mentioned, right? If you know that there's no plaque whatsoever and they keep coming back with chest pain, as long as you treat the patient, it's much less likely you would order some more tests. And that's been shown. Absolutely normal CTA is just, you know, but if you have normal treadmill, normal tre stress echo, normal nuclear, you still kind of have some lingering doubt, well, am I, you know, missing uh, disease, right? So, yeah. quick question, Dr. Chang. So, what about incorporating like calcium score prior to CTA? So, so like a lot of these patients yeah. are going to be zero, right? So, yeah, I, I think it's one of the topics that Dr. Q is passionate about is, you know, which tests, you know, we, we got to do. And, and Dr. Jim Mean told me, well, best test if you want to evaluate a patient is probably put him in a treadmill and do a calcium score right afterward. There you get all the information. You know, you get the function information, you, you get the uh, atherosclerosis information. Uh, because it's very unlikely if you have low degree of calcium score, let's say 10 or 20, uh, you exercise 10 minutes in a treadmill. I mean, you could have, you know, some 50, 70 percent stenosis could happen, but if you can exercise 10 minutes, I mean, you're not going to have left main or three vessel disease, and that's truly all you need to manage the patient, and very, very low cost, very, very low cost. Because I think um, a lot of times, if, you know, the calcium score is like over like 400 or something. Sometimes we call lesions like uninterpretable because there's just just severe concentric calcium. Oh, oh, that example, for instance, if someone has a thousand of calcium score going on a treadmill for let's say 12 minutes, uh, and there's ample data in nuclear war that if you have tw if you exercise more than 10, 12 minutes in the treadmill, Bruce protocol, the the, the incidence of significant left main or three vessel disease is less than one percent. Dr. Chang, um, if you have a calcium score of zero, how comfortable are you in, if a patient comes into the ER and they're screened for a chest pain? Uh, do you think that there could be a role for doing a calcium yeah, score I, and I, rolling I, them out in the ER with a score of zero? Well, Dr. Nabi did a lot of work on that. We know the, 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 pre the, in, the prevalence of more than 50% epicardial stenosis in, in patient symptomatic patient with chest pain is about five, five, to, five to eight percent. So meaning that five to eight percent of the patient with clinical calcium score with acute chest pain could have more than 50 percent stenosis in their angiogram in subsequent visit. But we know also to know that despite having the stenosis, the prognosis is, you know, is very, is excellent. Yes, you can miss some disease, but again, like any test is, you know, patient keep coming up chest pain, even despite negative calcium score, especially in, in, in patients who smoke, that has been shown, in smoker, you, you, you probably don't want to stop there, right? I mean, if they're high clinical suspicion, zero calcium score in the ED. Uh, there, there's database. I mean, there's a, a database of 45,000 patients, 20, 15 years follow-up. I mean, you're going to get much better than that. Zero calcium score. Basically, you have to be hit by a truck to be killed. So, so, I mean, there is very strong data in calcium score. It's not perfect. Sure, you can have a soft plaque. You know, you can always have the anecdote of, oh, that one patient. But if talking statistics and cost savings, it's very strong data out there. If you have a calcium score of zero, for 15 years, you have basically no, no events, you know. And actually, in that particular database study that they did, 
they look at every risk factor. So you have zero risk factors, you have one risk factor, you have two risk factors, you have three risk factors. At every level, the calcium scoring furthermore stratifies the patient at every level. So it's, you know, I think the data is very powerful. Yeah, you know, even if you have a negative normal coronary angiogram, invasive angiogram, if you have troponin elevation, this has been looked at in TME 18, the prognosis is not that good either. So if you think about it, you have troponin leak, you go patient with a cath lab, no coronary disease. The prognosis is not as good as, let's say, zero calcium score is zero. There's no head-to-head -head comparison, but I'm using examples. There's no testing. Even the best test, we think the gold standard, doesn't mean you are free of uh, any further event, right? A normal coronary angiogram still does not predict a good outcome if you have troponin elevation, right? Those patients who have chest pain. So how automated is your calcium scoring uh, approach? In other okay. words, can you have, is this something you could have a tech do initial calcium score? If it's zero, stop there. If it's over a certain number, 400 or 1,000, say stop, because my CTA is probably going to have problems because of blue Yeah, that has been calcium. looked, I think that has been looked at a lot of some places in initially won't do any CTA if the calcium score over 600 or 1,000. I think that's reasonable for a research study, but for clinical management, let's say you have 1,000 calcium score and I can see uh, one lesion, right? Very well, let's say I see mid LAD, I see very well 80% stenosis, and then I cannot see mid RCA because too much calcium. For management purposes, it doesn't really matter. I know there's a significant stenosis, whether it's two vessel, three vessel disease, most of them probably going to go to the cath lab with that degree of atherosclerosis. And the fellows can probably tell you the, how long did it take for you guys to learn how to do calcium score? Two minutes? I mean, I guess the question is automated enough that you could have the tech at the time of scanning, quickly calculate the calcium score absolutely, and absolutely. then decide to stop or proceed? Absolutely, yeah. Wouldn't be that different from what we do our nuclear stress-only imaging, right? I mean, if you have uh, already normal, if, basically if they can interpret a normal nuclear, I think any tech would be able to see if it's zero calcium or not. Absolutely, yeah. And then, well, I wouldn't say anatomy trump function. I think for patient who, that, we don't know. I think the key, true key here is for all the evidence of stable coronary disease that we know, the medical therapy works very well. You really care is to know if the patient has atherosclerosis or not. I think that's really the key, right? I mean, from the study that we did, you know, compared adding the additive value of calcium score over stress nuclear, I mean, most of the people that we do, they work in, the, you know, somebody working in your clinic, you talk to them for two or three minutes, you would probably know if the stress test is going to be normal or abnormal. Most of the time, it's probably going to be, right, normal. But you still don't know they have disease or not. That's why, in a sense, anatomical, in a sense, of presence of disease or not. Not much of, you know, 80, 80 90%, 80, 50, because you know those patients, you, you don't make them live longer by stenting them, so you need to, the treatment is the same. Yeah. Okay. So John and Omar, I want you to go back and ask your dad to say, if you get paid the same thing, the cardiac CT and nuclear, all right, and take you the same amount of time to read it, what would you prefer, a CT scanner or a nuclear scanner? I know what I want, but <laughs> that's a good question. I think I think it's it's a lot easier, right? You don't rely on isotope, right? Uh, contrast, you can have it there in your shelf for years, and uh, and also I think if calcium, if you can incorporate doing calcium score first, that's very attractive. Very very attractive. Uh, I, I'm trying to get, you know, it's interesting because GE bought this company from Israel and they, got, and they changed the name and they uh, make it public last year in ACC, uh, 2017 in Washington, D.C., and I don't think they have sold any scanner yet. There's now no information about the price. Uh, I just asked uh, 
Dr. Leipzig, who worked with GE very closely, he's very excited. He, in Vancouver, they're installing this camera. So, so anyway, it's just for the future. I think pretty, I think if things, I truly believe that eventually uh, CT has to be in, you know, you sh you, talking about point of care, right? I mean, why, why would this be different? Someone coming with chest pain, you want to know they have disease or not. Why not get it, the information the same day or the same morning, right? If you want it, if your calcium score is zero, you can even get that in less than 10 minutes, right? They walk to the, the other side of the room, put the electrodes. It's probably as easy as getting an EKG, essentially. I don't know. That excites me, at least when you practice, you know, you don't have to have them come back. Anyway. All right? So make sure. Thank you. All this to make sure the fellows will spend time in the CT lab. Some, get some of the image fellow out of the MRI.